Am I on now? Yes, great. So some books can completely change your life. Some books that you read can radically change your life. Now, now for me, growing up in a non-Christian home, when I first picked up a Bible, aged 18, reading the Bible completely and radically changed my life. I met Jesus as I read the Scriptures. But as a Christian over the years, I've read hundreds, if not thousands, of Christian books, and, and most are great, but there's just a few that just grip you and change you. I want to share two, two of those books tonight. One is called Transforming Grace by Jerry Bridges. You see, as a Christian, I understood that, that grace had saved me. But I was trying to live the Christian life by my own good deeds, my own works. And it was exhausting. I had lists of things which I must do and must not do, and things that I could do and couldn't do, and I had post-it notes all around my bedroom of all these things I was trying to do to please God. And it was utterly, utterly exhausting. And I read this book, and Jerry Bridges taught me that it's not just grace that saves me, but it's the same grace that sanctifies me. The grace that saves me is the grace that I live by. So I'm living my Christian life just immersed in God's grace. And that is just so liberating. And the second book is called What's So Amazing About Grace by, by Philip Yancey. And just so you understand this story, I read this book in, in 1998. And in 1998, I was at Bible college training for the ministry. And so I understood grace. I liked grace. I got grace. I could write copious essays on grace. But I wasn't yet amazed by it. I wasn't yet blown away by grace. I wasn't immersing my every being in God's grace. And reading this book just opened to my eyes that everything is about grace. It's like the hymn, Amazing Grace. It, why did you call it amazing? It's not just nice grace or beautiful grace. It's, a, it's incredible. This concept of God's undeserved love is utterly, utterly amazing. And my goal tonight is that you would leave here not just understanding grace or getting grace, but, but being completely blown away and amazed by it. And we're just looking at three verses, Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10. Just three verses. J.C. Ra says that, these three verses contain all that you need to know in the whole Bible. That's pretty cool. Uh, here's my, my one sentence for you to, to, to remember. If you, if you remember nothing else, remember this. We are saved by grace, through faith not works, to walk in good works. We're saved by grace, through faith not your good works, but you're saved in order to walk in good works. Let's start with that first phrase, we're saved by grace. That, that is chapter 2, verse 8. For it is by grace that you have been saved. It's by grace you have been saved. Uh, lots of words define me. I'm a man. I'm an Englishman. I'm a married man. I'm a clergyman. I'm an iron man. But the most important thing is, I'm a saved man. I'm a saved man. Because in a hundred years' time, no one will care where I lived or what car I drove or what school my kids went to or how many Ironmans I completed. But they will care that I was a saved man because that's the most important thing about you and about me. We are saved. The word saved in verse 8 is not a religious word. It's a, an everyday word. It just means rescued. It means to, to rescue someone from danger. It means to rescue someone from harm. It means to, to rescue somebody who's in a situation that's so dire and so fatal that they can't save themselves. And so when a doctor performs an operation to remove, remove a tumor, the doctor saves you. When a fireman pulls you out of a burning car that's about to explode, the, the fireman saves you. When the lifeguard pulls you out of a rip, the lifeguard saves you. Remember those Thai schoolboys, that football team that were stuck in the caves? They were helpless. They were hopeless. They were facing certain death. They couldn't save themselves. 
But the cave divers came in and they saved them. They rescued them. That's all that word means, that you've been rescued. So to be saved means to be rescued. That there's a rescue operation that God saw you in your helplessness. God saw you in your hopelessness. God saw you in your dire situation and he stepped in and he rescues you. So Christianity is not about super nice people. It's about saved people. And Christianity is not about religious people. It's about rescued people. But to be saved, you need to be saved from something. So what are you saved from? That is verses 1 to 3. It's on the screen. We looked at it last week. And you've got to believe this truth about yourself. As for you, you were dead. Not nearly dead, not half dead, not just breathing, but you were dead. I'm just what I shared with the medical students. So, you know, the medical students get a, a dead body, a corpse to do all their work on. Uh, the tutors say that about 80% of medical students, when the tutors and, and the other students aren't looking, go up to the body and just go, boo. <laughs> what does a corpse do? Nothing. Because it's dead. That's how God describes you, helpless, hopeless, dead. Dead in your transgressions and sins, in all the ways you said, stuff you, God, I'll do it my way. I know I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. In the ways that you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. So before you met Jesus, you were shaped by culture, you were shaped by society, and you found your identity, your purpose, your significance in the things of this world. You pursued money, popularity, fitness, fun, all the things that the world pursues with identity, and you, you were drawn into that. And that is crazy because the world doesn't acknowledge God. But that's what you were like. And you follow the rule of the kingdom of this air. You follow the devil who is the tempter, the accuser, the deceiver. And you just believed his lies. And it says all of us lived among them. There's, there's, there's no exception. Every human being lived among them at one time, gratifying, that's a, a beautifully descriptive word, gratifying the cravings of our flesh. So when we wanted to do something, we did it. When we felt like it, we just did it. And like the rest, we were deserving of wrath, of God's righteous, holy, just, measured anger. That is what we were all like. Helpless, hopeless, dead, and dire. And then God stepped in. Verse 4, but God, the two best words in the Bible, but God, because of his great love, because of his lavish love, he is rich in mercy, so he gives us what we don't deserve. He's rich in that mercy, so that mercy never runs out. So, but God stepped in and he saved us. Let, let me be very clear. To be saved is not just about you getting your ticket to heaven. To be saved is not just about you waiting for the last day to make sure you avoid hell. When Paul talks about salvation, he's talking about salvation now. He's talking about enjoying a saved life today because these verses tell us that to be saved means to be alive with Christ. To be saved means that you're not dead in your sins anymore, you're alive with Christ now. You get to live a life like Jesus lived. You get to talk to, to your heavenly Father like Jesus talked to him. To be, uh, to be saved means that you're raised with Christ today. It means that you, you, ha you don't fear death because death's been defeated. It means that you have power to conquer any and every sin. And to be saved means that you're already seated with Christ in glory. So that you can say to Satan, get behind me, Satan. That's what it means to be saved. It's not just waiting to that last day to make sure that you get into heaven. So, so God wants you to enjoy this Christian life, this saved life today. But how are you saved? Look at verse 8. If it's by grace that you have been saved... This is the how, by grace. You know when someone asks you, how did you become a Christian? It's that, that beautiful golden question, like, wow, that's a golden question. If someone says, how did you become a Christian, please never answer that question beginning with the word I. I went to Alpha. I went to church. I read my Bible. No, it wasn't about you. 
It was God who pursued you and God who wooed you and God who called you. It's like Sleeping Beauty. You know, the princess who is cursed into this deep sleep and only the kiss of the prince can awaken her. If I got the awakened Sleeping Beauty onto stage tonight, she would not say, I decided it was my time to wake up. Or I decided I would call the prince and demand that he come and kiss me. She would say, I was cursed, I was asleep, I was helpless, but the prince came and the prince kissed me. And if you're a Christian, that is your testimony. The prince came, Jesus came, the king of kings, the lord of lords, and he came and he not just kissed you, but he loved you and he lavished you with grace. It's by grace you have been saved. Grace is the key ingredient. It's, it's amazing. It, now, you've heard the acronym God's Riches at Christ's expense, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. We, we all quote the acronym, but what does it mean? Uh, the word for grace is just the word charis, and it literally means undeserved favor. Undeserved, unmerited favor. It literally just means a gift, not a reward, but a gift. It's like when you give a child a a gift for their birthday. Say you buy them a Nintendo Switch for their birthday. Now, any parent who gives a child a gift does not expect their child to open the gift and say to their parents, okay, how much do I owe you? Because it's a gift. Or it's like a university student. Imagine that you're at university. Some of you don't need to imagine this, but if you're at university and you do nothing, you never turn up for any lecture, you never write any essays or any, sit any exams, and then Sydney University give you the University Medal for Academic Achievement. You'd say that is wrong because that person did nothing. And that is grace. It's inexplicable, unexplainable, unreasonable if you want, bizarre reason, mind-blowingly amazing that, that God would choose to gift us with things that we have done absolutely diddly squat to earn. God chooses to make us alive when we were dead. God chooses to sacrifice his son and to spare us from his wrath. That is the gift of grace. Not deserved and not earned. Listen carefully. Grace is not adding sprinkles onto an already wonderful cupcake. Not adding sprinkles to a wonderful cupcake is, is taking a stone and turning a stone into a wonderful cupcake, because you are that stone. You're not a wonderful cupcake. You're a stone. <laughs> and there's nothing deserving within yourself that means that you are worthy of anything. You didn't choose God. He chose you. I love the story of the man who was giving his testimony. And this is word for word what he said. God sought me. God found me. God loved me, God called me, God saved me, God delivered me, God pardoned me, God cleansed me, God healed me, all by the power of God's wonderful grace. And a legalistic evangelical Christian criticized him and said, oh, you forgot to mention your part in your testimony. And the man said, my part? Oh, okay, my part, my part was just to do all the sinning. And God's part was to do all the saving. My part was just to run away from God, but God's part was to chase after me. That is grace. And I, I think we struggle with grace because from the moment that we are born, we live in a, a culture and a society where you are taught about achievements and rewards and success and conditional love. Every other sphere of your life is about rewards. Work harder, get rewarded. Do well, get rewarded. Do something amazing, get the applause. What you do is what you get. But God doesn't work like that. We contributed zilch to our salvation. And if you've grasped grace, then the only right response is just gratitude. It's to say, thank you, thank you. I don't know whether you've seen that, that clip, the YouTube clip of the the Chilean miners who were stuck underground for 69 days and every single one was rescued. And when you watch this clip, 
the first words to come out of every single rescued miner was, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That is the only response to grace. Why do you find it hard to accept a free gift? You know, most people don't like to receive a free gift. We, we, there's something inbuilt within us where uh, I need to do something in return. You know, try, and buy, try buying a coffee for a friend this week. Shout them a coffee, and I can guarantee they will say, I'll buy the next one, <laughs> or I owe you one. No, I'm just giving you a free coffee. Just say thank you. <laughs> it's the wonder of grace. So we're saved by grace, through faith, not works. See that verse 8, through faith. That's the channel, that's the instrument, through faith. I love the fictional story, the made-up story of the farmer. This farmer is strong and he's fit and he's fast, but he's not the brightest cookie in the world. He's a bit slow. And so the, the fire truck goes up to the first burning building and the fire chief shouts out, Get the hoses to put out the fire. And so this fireman gets out the hoses and chucks the hoses into the burning building. And the chief goes, what are you doing? He said, you told me the hoses put out the fire. He said, no, no, only water puts out fire. Only water puts out fire. He said, okay, I've got that. And later that day, they go to a second fire, and the truck turns up at the second fire, and the truck is full of lots of water, but there's no hoses on the truck. And the chief says, where are the hoses? And the farmer goes, oh, I thought they were a trip hazard, and you told me that only water puts out the fire, so we've got the water. And he says, but without the hoses, you can't get the water to the fire. You need both the water and the hoses. And that is like grace and faith. We know that only grace puts out the fire. We know that the fire of sin and the fire of hell is only put out by grace. It's grace alone. But faith is like the, the hose, like the channel through which that grace flows. What is this word faith in verse 8? There's a big debate over this word. It, it could be our faith or it could be the faithfulness of Jesus. It could be our belief, or it could be the reliability of Jesus. I think it's both. Uh, the word there is pistos. It means to trust or to believe, to, to trust God's promises, to believe God's character, to, to actually trust that God will do what he said he will do. But, you know, belief is such a strange word because lots of people claim to believe, don't they? Lots of people claim to believe God exists and they claim to believe God is holy and God is righteous and God is good and people claim to believe that Jesus existed and Jesus lived and Jesus died. I mean, this church, God willing, will be, will be packed to the rafters on Friday and on Sunday with people who claim to believe. But according to the Scriptures, even the demons believe that and shudder. That's not saving belief. That's not saving faith. Because saving faith is when your belief in truths about God actually impact your day-to-day -day living. Saving belief, saving faith is when these intellectual essential truths about God shape everything about you. It's when you say, I do believe that Jesus came to give me life to the full, and I do believe that he dies that I would not die, and I do believe that, and it's going to change the way that I live. That is saving faith. It's called allegiance to Christ, where you're in Christ, and everything that about him just shapes everything about you. That is faith. Now, please remember, when it comes to faith, it is not about the amount of faith that you have. It's the object of the faith that you put your trust in. Please don't say to me, Paul, I, I, I don't have enough faith. My faith isn't strong enough to save me. Of course it's not. But Jesus is strong enough to save you, so put your faith in him. So it's the water of God's grace and the, the hose of my faith. Is that what the Bible says? No. No, look at verse 8. It's by grace you've been saved through faith. And look at this next bit. And this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God. Doesn't that blow your mind? Even your faith is not from yourself. It's the gift of God. E even your trust, your belief in God, it didn't come from within you. It came as a gift of God. 
It's God who wooed you. It's God who pursued you. It's God who drew you to himself. It's God who enabled you to have this faith. And so you can't take any credit for anything. <laughs> Read your Bibles by yourself. The cross is foolishness, 1 Corinthians 1. By ourselves, we cannot understand the things of God, 1 Corinthians 2. By ourselves, we are blind to the gospel, 2 Corinthians 4. It's all of God and all of God and all of God. Through faith, verse 8, and not by your works. See that verse 9? You're saved by grace through faith, but not by your works. So you know all that stuff that you do, all the nice things you do, all the good things you do? It counts for nothing. Oh, it's good stuff, but it doesn't save you. And the works here is probably religious works, works of righteousness, works of the law. And so all your Bible reading, all your praying, all your worshipping, all your church attendance, all your leading of Bible studies, it is good stuff. But it's not saving stuff. Now Paul, who wrote this letter, now before he met Jesus, he was a strict Pharisee. He was a good man. He was an upright man. He was... In the temple, in the church, every single day, he was saying his prayers, he was fasting, he was on rosters, he was an evangelist, he was a full-on for God. But when he understood that it is about grace, he said, whatever was to my gain, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. All that stuff that I did, I consider it garbage or dung compared to knowing Jesus. So church, please don't think God's up in heaven looking down on you and go, wow, wow, he led worship so amazingly and he reads his Bible and she says her prayers and she's on so many rosters and serving. I think I might lavish my grace on to save them. It's not how it works. What did you do? Nothing. What did God do? Everything. <laughs> So, church, why do we subtly think that we need to do anything? Why do we subtly add works to our salvation? We all do it. We all secretly think that a little part of what we do contributed a fraction to our salvation. It didn't. It's like at a funeral. I love doing funerals. I, I love finding out about people's lives. I wish I knew about people's lives before they died. And people stand up and they share the most extraordinary facts of what these people achieved in life. And people achieve extraordinary things. You know, this person established this business and this person established this charity. And this person every single week went to this nursing home. You think, wow, that's amazing stuff. I love hearing their stories. But none of that stuff saved them. Not by works, verse 9, so that no one can boast. To boast just means to ascribe value to. Now we are called to boast in the Bible. We're called to boast in God. We're called to boast in Jesus. We're called to boast in the cross of Christ. But we just don't boast in ourselves. Let me ask you, what do you have to boast about? When it comes to your salvation, if you are saved tonight, what do you have to boast about? Oh, you can boast that you did all the, all the sinning. But Jesus did all the saving. Now, most evangelicals stop at verse 9. We love verses 8 and 9. Saved by grace, through faith, amen. Let's get our doctrine right. The doctrine of salvation by grace and faith alone. But Paul doesn't stop at verse 9. Because that's an incomplete gospel. Verse 10, for we are God's handiwork. The word there is craftsmanship. Isn't that beautiful? That, that you are God's perfect masterpiece. That God created you exactly the way he wanted to create you. You are precious. You are unique with your unique personality, your unique gift. You are God's masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Spot that? So you're not saved by your good works, but you are expected to do good works. Salvation is not a result of your good works, but if you are saved, then you should do good works. 
works play no part whatsoever in your salvation or you becoming a Christian or even staying a Christian, but works should play a massive, huge part in your daily Christian life. We should do good. We should be known as do-gooders. John Wesley is one of my heroes of faith. His, His life slogan was this, do no harm, do good, and stay in love with Jesus. Isn't that a great motto? Do no harm, do good, and stay in love with Jesus. But if you know John Wesley's story, he, he grew up in a pharisaical Anglican home, a good religious boy. He, but he'd never grasped grace. He was preaching, but he hadn't grasped grace. Until one day he was sharing the gospel with a, a prisoner who was about to be hanged the next day. And as he explained the gospel to this prisoner, he suddenly realized a kind of a thief on the cross moment that, that this man had no opportunity to do any good works. And the penny dropped. It really was all of grace. And suddenly all the good works that he was doing for God became a delight and not a duty. All the good things he was doing for God became excited to do them rather than he is expected to do them. And let me explain what John Wesley did. I'll quote this. John Wesley set up mercy ministries for the poor and the destitute. He opened the first world's food pantry. He gave his time willingly and eagerly to visit the sick and feed the hungry and clothe the naked. He lived a very frugal life. As his wealth increased, he gave away more and more money. He lived in the same house almost his entire life. As his wealth increased, he didn't buy bigger houses. He just used his money to do more good deeds. He was selfless with his time and his talent and his money. He was a do-gooder. Because he had grasped grace. We're not saved by grace, but we are saved to... So we're saved by grace, but we are saved to do good works. That's what verse 10 says. We are God's handiwork, created, or literally new created, or born again. That's the idea. So you are born again into Christ Jesus, and your purpose of being born again is to do good works. Actually, the NIV is a bad translation. Literally, it's to walk in good works. And I love that because if, you like, if you're a Bible scholar, then in verse 1, you are walking in sins and transgressions. In verse 10, you are walking in good deeds. Before you met Jesus, you walked in the ways of this world. After you met Jesus, you walk in good deeds. So what are these good works? What are these good works that God has prepared for us to do? Please understand this. It, it is not a list. It's a lifestyle. It is not a list of things that you must do. It's a lifestyle that you want to live. It's not a list of things that you have to achieve. It's a lifestyle of a a life that you want to live. You get to live. It's a joy to live. What are the good deeds? It's chapters 4 to 6 of Ephesians. To Your attitude towards other people, the words that you speak, the, the ways that you serve. Putting very simply... The good works are living a life just like Jesus lived. To walk in good works means that you get to live a life of sacrificial service, just like Jesus lived. He didn't come to be served, but to serve. And we get to do that. We, we get to live a life where we, we pour ourselves out on behalf of others and, and to honor God. We, we get to live a life where we pour ourselves out and we get our hands dirty and our feet dirty in serving other people, expecting nothing in return. It's a deep joy to do that, isn't it? To live a life of good works means that we, we get to live a life of intimacy with God where we enjoy talking to Him just like Jesus did. To live a life of good works means that we, we live a life of compassion. Because when Jesus saw those who were harassed and helpless, he did something about it. He felt compassion and then he did something about it. He actually acted in a way to help that person, to heal that person. And we get to do that. We get to be his hands and feet. To live a life that Jesus lived is to live a life of of companionship, not doing the Christian life alone. To live a life that Jesus lived is to live a life of unhurried presence. I don't imagine Jesus sat with people and made them feel like there was somebody else on his busy schedule. 
And to live a life of good works means that you actually give people your time. To live a life of good works means that you live a life of proclaiming the gospel because that's how Jesus lived. This is the good works. Nothing flashy. We, we just get to live like Jesus lived. And it's not burdensome. It's a joy. It's a delight. And we don't have to do it all. That's a relief, isn't it? You are not this world's savior. You're not expected to do all the good works that need to be done on this earth. You can't do it. I can't do it. Because I hope you notice that verse 10 is actually plural and not singular. We are God's handiwork. Created in Christ is to, to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. What is the us? Your brothers and sisters is called the church. This is the beauty of the church. We get to do the good works as a church that the world needs to see and experience. Isn't that a relief that no one person can do all the good works that need to be done? And God gave each of us here different gifts. Some of us here are evangelists, some are pastors, some are amazing with older people, some are amazing with kids, some are amazing with administration, some of the gift of worship music. But we don't want one person to do it all. We can't do it all. That's why God created church, so that we as an entity, as a body, can do the good works that God prepared us to do as we reach a world that is desperate for grace. Philip Yancey says this, I rejected the church because I found so little grace there. Later, I returned to the church because I found grace nowhere else. And our world is desperate for grace. Our world is thirsting for grace. And we as a church don't just talk about grace or explain grace. We should live grace. We should ooze grace. Church should be a place not dispensing guilt but dispensing grace. I love what Martin Luther says. God, God does not need your good works, but your neighbor does. Your neighbor needs to see your good works so they can see Jesus in you and so you can point them to grace. So next time someone calls you a do-gooder, say thank you very much because that means you've understood grace. You're not saved by your works, but you're saved for good works. You don't have to do them, but you get to do them. And that's a joy, isn't it? Just to say to God, here I am, just use me today to do good works that you've called me to do. Let me pray. I'm going to pray a prayer that John Wesley wrote or said. Heavenly Father, may we do all the good that we can by all the means that we can in all the ways that we can, in all the places that we can, at all the times that we can, to all the people that we can, as long as we ever can. So Lord, help us to be your hands and feet to do these good works that you have prepared for us to do. Open our eyes, even tonight, even tomorrow, to the opportunities to do good. And Lord, would you give us the, the motivation, the opportunities, the, the power of your spirit to actually step into those opportunities, to do the good works. Lord, rid us of pride. Lord, would you remove from us any hint that these good works contribute to our salvation. Thank you for grace. Thank you, Lord, that we are completely undeserving. And yet you rescued us. We love you, Lord, and we want to be used by you for your glory to be a channel of that grace to a needing world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand in worship.